Thank you, Jeff. Why isn't that? There we go. Um, okay, good morning, everybody. Um, what I'm going to be talking to uh, today is the core material and um, what we do with the cores and how we provide the cores to um, to the rest of the specialists and to give you a, a sort of flavour within the context of the Southern River Valley, which um, uh, Simon has previously um, talked about. Um, I'm a bit like uh, 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 a, a ringmaster here. I just gather everybody else's data and and, and parcel it up and, and and do things with it and interpret it. So this is based on uh, this, this talk is based on lots of people's work. But I would like to point out John Whitaker, who whose role is crucial in the um, uh, the approach that we've um, adopted. And you'll see how how this works in due course. Why is that not going? Am I not being able to move forward? Oh, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the um, landscapes. Why um, landscapes? I just like those quotes by um, Crawford about the intellectual um, delights of working on past geographies. Um, I just thought I should share those um, with you. Um, but I'm really talking about this area here. This is the Southern River Valley that Simon was talking about. He showed you a seismic um, line across the mouth of the valley here. Um, and it's this area here and all the cores that really form the focus of uh, my talk uh, today. So here we are um, in these blue dots here are the cores and the location of the cores um, in the Southern River Valley between these um, uh, postulated end moraines of the ice um, during the last um, cold stage. And of course, we're off the East Anglian coast here, um, just outside this white zone. Um, where we don't have any data that Mark was um, referring to uh, before. So these are our cores. We've got 33 sample locations, um, approximately. Some of uh, these core locations have uh, more than one core. Um, they've been replicated, um, but we've got 33 sample locations. The cores that we're talking about range from a meter in length to uh, up to five meters in length. Some of them, like uh, core 38 over here, go straight into um, till. Others fully penetrate the Holocene. Some don't get to the bottom of the Holocene um, and some are in um, bedrock. So they, they vary in um, terms of what's in them and how long a record they um, preserve. And um, I should think about 50% of those 33 cores have um, sequences in them that are, have been used um, for the environmental reconstruction of this area. Now, just to show you how big an area we're talking about, because I, I think it's quite difficult very often to think about the, the scale and scope of some of these um, landscapes where they're buried now beneath the sea. So what I've just done here is superimposed a map of the lower Thames onto um, our Southern River Valley. So um, here you can see the, the, the northernmost cause, here's the mouth of the River Valley here. And this is the lower Thames from um, central London and the Houses of Parliament down to the, um, the areas that swinging out into the more open estuary. So we're dealing with a, a, a valley that's about that length. And I think that's quite important because um, when we think about the number of data points, about the number of lines of information um, that we're trying to use to reconstruct this um, landscape, um, we need to bear in mind the, the sort of scale of, of, of the landscape that we're talking about. Um, it's also worth pointing out that while in a situation like the Lower Thames, we're dealing with um, a river valley where most of our sequences along the main river valley are used to um, reconstruct the main processes um, that have been going on in that landscape. Sometimes the little tributary valleys are also equally, if not more important. So for example, in the Lower Thames, the Ebbsfleet, this tiny little insignificant valley here preserves a really important um, record of um, environmental change, both during the Holocene and back into, into to, to the, the, the Pleistocene. So when we're thinking about um, niches and, and um, locations in which humans might be doing things, we need to bear in mind 
the different scales uh, that we're working um, at. Um, the other thing to, to bear in mind, um, again, I'm using an example from the Lower Thames here, from the Dartford Bridge out towards the, the estuary. This is an attempt to, to reconstruct the, um, the, the early Holocene landscape beneath the, the floodplain based on 880 data points. It's still difficult, even with that high resolution of data, and we've got 33 data points in our landscape. But of course, we also have the seismic data, which we don't have the um, in the Lower Thames. So um, these are all just uh, things to, to ponder and think about when, when we're trying to reconstruct these sorts of landscapes. So the model we're using for this landscape is that of a tide dominated estuary, as in this model by Dalrymple, where we have marine dominated and uh, a, 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 um, a meandering uh, river dominated part of the estuary, and where we go from um, tidal channels through mudflats, salt marsh into freshwater wetland. And that just gives you the sort of sense of how we begin to think about this landscape um, and um, how it's operating. So in a sort of long profile through the river, and this will become important later on, we, we, we move from open estuarine marine conditions through brackish tidal mudflats into a tidal river and into the freshwater um, river. And these are obviously all associated with their own unique um, assemblages of plants and animals and also um, sediment uh, types as indicated um, there. And, and those are not a, a, an exhaustive um, list of the of, of the types of sediments we'd find in those areas of course um so when we've been looking at the doggerland cores and we've been um, working on them we can find in this landscape all of these sorts of um uh, environments of deposition and associated sedimentary sequences and you can see the the the, the um the cores core numbers down here. Not all of these, I hasten to add, come from the Southern River, um, but the majority of them um, do. What we don't see, apart from freshwater marsh sequences, peat deposits here, are um, what I would call terrestrial, true terrestrial deposits. Um, we, we don't see colluvium. We haven't seen anything in any of our cores um, that resembles uh, the sort of colluvial sequences that you'd find either in the late glacial um, or um, in the, the Holocene. Um, and we don't see well-developed paleosols in any of these locations, even where we're drilling on the, um, uh, the tail where you'd expect potentially a paleosol to be developed. We don't see these. Um, and, and this is perhaps not surprising because the, 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 the cores have been located um, away from those um, sorts of um, situations in many cases to, to get the big picture story. Um, just to show you what the sort of sequences might look like in, if we were to able to, to see them on, on, the sh uh, on an open um, a section on the seabed. This is the sort of basal peat that we see in the Thames, and this is the sort of peat that we see in a number of our cores in um, the, the Southern River Valleys and elsewhere. So basing again the sort of anticipated sequences that we might find um, in our system on the sort of model for Southern England. This is the sort of model that I would use for, for the lower reaches of many of our river valleys, showing the relationship between the late Pleistocene gravels periglacial um, solid flexion deposits on the valley sides, the, the alluvium, the estuarine alluvium with intercalated peats, and then the colluvium. So again, this is the sort of model that we, we have in our mind when we're thinking about these. Um, and of course, we need to think about the controls on, the, uh, on these processes and things like tectonic movements, um, sediment um, input and output, sea level rise and fall and biogenic decay alongside climate change are all important to consider when we're trying to interpret our, our sedimentary sequences. So what happens to, to the cores when they come back off the boat? Um, the cores are recovered. They were taken to um, the University in Warwick um, where we spent a long time in a very small room um, and uh, dressed in white suits and masks and gloves, not very comfortable. Um, also under red light to cut the cores because we wanted to be able to use the cores for both OSL dating and um, uh, paleoenvironmental uh, and geological um, <clears throat> and DNA analysis. So the cores were split in the red, under red light 
half the core was wrapped in black plastic that went off to um uh, stored in 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 Lampeter in the um core store here that you can see um that was bought for the project and then osl dating being done at saint andrews the other half of the core after splitting under red light was taken into the it was we turned the lights on we were able to sample for dna the cores went back to to Lampeter. we undertook um, the recording of the photography and rapid assessment of the, the, the samples and rangefinder dating. And I'll talk about the rapid assessment in a minute. Um, that provided the information from a primary deposit model um, and the lithostratigraphic and environmental synthesis. That's the sort of level I'm talking about today. It then went, the cause also went through primary assessments for pollen, for uh, diatoms and things. Full analysis followed, high, high resolution radiocarbon dating. We've also done uh, geochemical core scanning, which you'll hear about this afternoon. And then the final phase, once everybody done whatever they wanted to do with the cores, they were chopped up for plant macrofossil beetle and mollusk um, analysis. Um, having said that, there is still core material um, available. The, the, core, the core store is still full of, of, of many of these um, sequences. So we do retain the possibility of, of, of additional works, which we didn't anticipate at the outset of this project. So anybody who's got any wacky ideas or interesting ideas to do with the cores, then there may well be material out there for you. Um, the rapid assessment of the core materials, we looked at, we would take um, samples through the major stratigraphic units, um, assess for the preservation of all sorts of material, plant material, ostracods, forearms, diatoms, um, <clears throat> mollusks, small mammal remains, etc. So we got a, 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 a quick look see as to what's there. John Whitaker did this. This is his work. Um, we then used the forearms and the ostracods divided into groups based on different um, environmental tolerances to characterize the depositional environment of each of the major stratigraphic units. Um, and here's his, his table here. And we were also able to identify species present, which might be cold climate things, which might be warm climate things, which might be reworked from the, the Pleistocene, um, et cetera. And so here's ELF-19, um, stratigraphy and this rapid assessment and the um, subdivision of that um, cause. And then that information was used by the, the rest of the paleoenvironmental team to decide where and what to sample. So here we are, here's the, 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 the Southern Valley. I've divided it into the Valley Mouth, the Outer Valley, the Inner Valley, and uh, an inner basin, and what I call the saddle here. Um, so these are the sort of main geomorphological um, parts of this um, valley and each area has its own um, relatively unique set of, of sequences. Here you can see the elevation of the top of the cores, not the bottom of the cores, um, from the inner basin down to the valley mouth, broadly um, declining as one might expect in elevation um, down valley sequence. An oddity down here, um, core number 39. Um, constructed a series of transects across uh, across the valleys here showing the profiles the modern day profiles of, of, of the valley um and so you can see here here's the inner basin around about minus 26 meters here's the saddle um and the inner valley here's again the inner basin and then we move down the system um and this um in the valley mouth is approximately where simon showed that um seismic section Briefly, and I, I, I can see I'm running up against time, um, a few of the results. This is the sequence of cores across the valley mouth here in, in, in this sort of direction here. And you can see on the on the west side here, cores very thin. We're onto bedrock chalk. Interesting, bedrock chalk outcropping very close to the surface down here. Um, across the rest of the area, we see cores that are dominated by sand fasces, that are producing dates of between 80,000 and about uh, um, 35,000 on a number of cores um, across this area. So putting these back in the Pleistocene um, in uh, isotope stage um, four and three. So there's the, the correlation of those all showing the same fasces. Um, here's John's rapid microfossil assessment. And you can see um, these are outer estuarine um, environments They've got cool and cold climate um, 
uh, forearms and um, uh, forearm species in here, suggesting that um, these are, are, are cold climate things. And here are the dates from 83 to 35,000 in um, here. Um, also note over here, it says Azola. Azola is a reworked um, plant remain that outcrops normally in uh, marine isotope stage nine and 11 sequences. So this is reworking in, into, the, um, into these cold climate uh, uh, marine sequences, showing that somewhere over here are exposed middle Pleistocene sediments. And we've got Holocene material on the top there. Um, these deposits that I've been talking about ha have been correlated with the Brown Bank formation, or they may perhaps be um, uh, Dogger Bank formation. This is the Here's a sea level curve for the last uh, 120,000 years and the isotope stages here. This is the outcrop of our sediments in this box here. Oops, sorry. These are the dates for those sediments. So they're occurring in, as I say, mainly in isotope stage three and going into isotope stage two. If those dates are correct, then those deposits should be down here. So this suggests that at least in the valley mouth, we might be looking at some quite considerable uplift um, uh, during the um, late Pleistocene, early Holocene of some of these sediment sequences. Moving in and up the valley, we're now, the last sequences I showed you are here, we're now going into the outer valley. Um, we have a series of cores running up to 31A here, where we have um, outer estuarine fasces, uh, forearms and ostracods um, in here, outer estuarine going to brackish and returning to outer estuarine, suggesting perhaps some sort of marine temporary re regression in the middle of this core here. But as we move up to 51 and 31, the marine fasces are replaced by tidal river fasces and freshwater fasces. So we think flooding starts here about 13 and a half thousand years ago. Um, Flooding starts here, marine flooding about 9,000 years ago, or 10,000 years ago, sorry, um, and, and a similar um, sorts of dates here. So we've got a, a package in the lower valley of um, the, the valley flooding by 13,000 years ago, possible slight regression in here. We've got a tidal river running in this part of the valley until around about 10,000 years ago and fresh water to about 9.2 thousand years ago. So we're beginning to build up the picture of what's happening in the lower valley. As we move into the inner valley, there's a sudden shift and jump in elevation of the sequences and in, in the, in the fasces. So we, we, we see um, brackish mudflats now developing um, in this part. We don't have any dates on, on this yet. Um, up to here, we've got brackish um, conditions starting around about uh, 9,400 um, years ago um, in, in here, um, sat on top of a nice peach sequence that goes back to about 13,500 uh, 13, years ago. And then finally up here, 34, this is on what I call the saddle, which is up here, um, which is a sequence of peats that runs from about 14,000 years ago to about 9,000 years ago, contains some really interesting uh, pollen, plus some interesting um, fish remains from, from the base of the sequence here. Uh, and this is some sort of perched um, water table feature high, high up, on, well, relatively high up on the valley sides. Um, so that's just showing the, the, the sequence of, of, of all of those um, long profiles from the mouth um, over here. Um, up to the saddle in here. We've also got a, a, a sequence of, uh, of cores from this inner basin. This is where the, um, the uh, tsunami core came from um, here um, in 01. Um, interestingly, in this part of the, 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 um, the sequence, we've got a lot more salt marsh. We don't see much salt marsh at all developed in, in the um, uh, main part of the valley. So, so this basin's working slightly differently. Um, so going back to my original model here, which we use from southern England, um, we can modify that in the red box is really where most of our cores come from. Um, and we see the late Pleistocene gravels, we see tidal freshwater river deposits, we see possibly basal peat deposits in places, um, estuarine alluvium and then subtidal flats. We're not seeing anything out towards the edge of the valley here. 
so this is one of the areas we need to start looking um, in the future if we get an opportunity to go back. There are anomalies um, in this uh, landscape and with the cores, um, core 39 is anomalous. Um, it looks from all intents and purposes um, as uh, very similar to many of our sequences um, with um, freshwater river deposits, cold climate, um, forums, uh, ostracods rather, um, in the base here, going up into brackish uh, marine deposits. The only problem with this um, core is it's down here. It's considerably lower in elevation than anything else. The dates suggest it's flooding from the freshwater into the brackish around about the same time as the, 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 the flooding in, in um, parts of the inner valley. So what's going on here is there some sort of um, barrier that is, has, has prevented this flooding at an early date. This, you know, we, do, we are dealing with tunnel valleys, but something must have kept the water out, the, the, the marine waters out um, from this. So we need to think about the potential barriers in this landscape. So in conclusion, this is the first time I think that an area um, in Doggerland of a single valley has been looked at in detail. Mostly previously, you know, isolated cores have been looked at. Here we've targeted something in detail and, and this is unique. The valley systems are complex. We've got perched water bog systems, river, valley, estuary, coastal embayment, um, all of which um, are enticing to Mesolithic people. And we've identified that there are subtle differences in patterns of sedimentation that occur um, in these landscapes. We have a lot of problems, um, undoubtedly. Um, there are this potential uplift in the valley mouth. We don't understand the valley mouth geomorphology fully yet. Um, we have some sea level index points, but some of the, um, they are maybe limited. We've got issues of localized geomorphology at a scale commensurate with that of thinking about the archaeology and particularly zoning the areas into you know, the, the valley into areas of archaeological potentials. And we do have um, evidence of recycling of older material into younger sediments. Um, the Azola is a very good example of um, that. What does the future hold? Um, well, the, the, the work we've done is, is a good, good start. We now need to look at cross valley profiles and the margins of sequences to see if we can find these more terrestrial deposits that I was talking about that we're missing. Um, we need to better understand the mouth of the valley. It's interesting we've got chalk bedrock here um, uh, because you know that's going to supply, supply a source of raw material for tooling up for um, late Pleistocene and early Holocene um, humans. We need to think about the, the role that barriers, maybe beach barriers or other forms of barriers may control and may play in controlling patterns of sedimentation. And I also think we need to, to look at these smaller and potentially tributary barriers in which um, unique sequences may be preserved. So that's it. Um, thank you. And again, thank you to all the um, people who've collaborated with this. And sorry if I've mangled your words and your interpretations. Very good. Thank you, uh, Martin. Uh, thank you again for keeping to time. Um, we have one question in the chat box uh, from John Adams. Uh, is there evidence in the plant and tree life of human influence, occupation, crops even? To which, if I may, I will amplify, do you have any um, evidence in those cores of anthropogenic influence or even archaeological material? Uh, we, 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 we don't have um, archaeological material in the cores. Um, we've obviously not sieved everything because in order to genuinely rule that out, um, we'd have to, you know, sieve the whole core. Um, but certainly in, in the cutting of the cores, we haven't seen anything. In terms of the plants and the pollen, I, I will defer that question until you've listened to, to Ben um, after, after coffee, because Ben's in a far better position to comment on, on, on that uh, sort of thing um, with me. I think one of the things to, to, to point out is the, um, you know, the majority of these cores are coming from um, situations where we 
where we might not expect to find certainly in situ evidence for um, human activity. So the majority of the cause, you know, coming from intertidal and subtidal um, sand and mud flats are not going to be the places you'd ne necessarily expect to, to, to find archaeology. Obviously, the um, 34, which is a, a, is a terrestrial deposit in, in what, what I would defer, define as terrestrial. Um, but again, it's, it's a pretty wet, marshy um, environment. So this is why I think we need to target the, um, the, the valley sides and really see if we can pick up some of these colluvial sequences and um, paleosols. It did surprise me. We didn't find any paleosols in any true sort of dry land um, situations. Um, so I'm not sure whether that answers the question fully or whether it's, um, but in part that answers your question. Okay. Well, we have a comment that was added to the chat here by Ben Geary who's giving a paper a little later, who says that uh, the next paper will touch on evidence for human impact or not. So stay tuned for that. We have um, one more question, time for it, from Chantal Connolly. Do we know if any British rivers feed into this one? Just thinking of the predominant riverine distribution of early Mesolithic sites and some of the patterns in East Anglia. I, th I think, um, Chantel, in, in, in this case, the, 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 this river is entirely um, within Doggerland. You know, the headwaters are probably somewhere in the vicinity of the inner basin. We don't quite know how, well, I don't quite understand how, how the, the, the river um, relates um, to that. Some of the rivers that might enter the coastal embayment from the to the south west of 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 where we where we're working might well drain um parts of east anglia but um not not directly into the southern rivers that we that we've been looking at it's entirely contained in doggerland okay um Two questions have just been added. I think we can take them. Anthony Firth um, is asking one of them. Three questions. They're coming in thick and fast. Uh, Trevor Faulkner asks about um, whether Doggerland was covered by an ice dammed lake. Uh, and do you see lacustrine clay deposits from that? In, in the, all the cores that we've got, there, there are no... Um, clearly lacustrine deposits. There are sediments that could have formed in um, the entry points to, to lakes, but when we don't find fine-grained um, lake deposits that, that, um, that are clearly lacustrine, no, is, is the answer to that. But that, that doesn't mean they're not there. It just means that, that our cores don't, haven't sampled them. OK, well, that probably leads into the other two questions I've got here. Anthony Firth asks, are there indications of query extensive erosion in your sequences, which might have a bearing on understanding the presence of archaeological material? Um, well, there are cut and fill sequences in the freshwater um, sand and gravel sequences, yes. Um, the tops of the peats might be um, eroded but again you know I would come back to I don't think we're in the the cause of not being taken in the places where we're likely to see that sort of activity in a big way on the edge of um, you know on the dryland wetland interface where you might have expected archaeology to be in the first place and secondly um, for it to be um, subsequently eroded. Okay uh, that sort of is followed up by this final question the last one we'll take from Katrina Dula Anderson, who says, concerning the terrestrial deposits that you want to locate, what are the chances for their preservation in general? A good question, um, to which I'm not sure. Um, we don't know. We haven't. Um, they're obviously going to be patchy. They're obviously going to be relatively thin. Um, and we haven't, we haven't targeted um, any of the previous um, survey to look for them primarily because we didn't have the high resolution data um, that we now have. And of course, the, the, the coring program was, was, was set up earlier in the, um, 
in, in the project. I would be surprised if there aren't places, particularly perhaps in some of these smaller um, streams feeding into the river valley where we don't get those sorts of situations. But um, ask me again in five years time if we've got funding and, and uh, I, I might be able to answer that. <laughs>